Welcome to the Carroll High School Passing the Torch Speaker Series. Today we have a panel of um, military members speaking of the students about their experiences. Um, thank you to Colonel Urban Gillespie, class of 1986, representing the U.S. Space Force. Lieutenant Colonel Vince Jacobs, class of 1994, and Major Amanda Taylor Nerg, class of 2005, representing the U.S. Air Force. Major James Borchers, class of 2002, representing the Ohio Army National Guard. Lieutenant Commander Nicholas Memering, class of 2005, representing the U.S. Navy. Captain Jonathan Lauren, class of 2006, representing the U.S. Marine Corps. And Lieutenant Junior Grade Adam Wilhelm, class of 2015, representing the U.S. Coast Guard. So thank you again. and. Um, Colonel Gillespie, would you like to start today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to start. I'm going to talk about the Space Force. However, I am an Air Force uh, veteran, retired, um, and uh, hopefully uh, I can shed a little bit of light on this, uh, the newest uh, uh, member of our, uh, our, our, our de Department of Defense. Um, so I, I'm going to start off with quickly just a, a little bit about my path since I left Carroll, since I graduated. Uh, as uh, Julie mentioned, I I graduated in 1986, uh, a little after, uh, you know, Carol was uh, about uh, 25 years old at that time. And uh, uh, I left uh, Carol and went to the University of Notre Dame. Uh, I did so on an Air Force ROTC scholarship. And, and for me, <clears throat> that was an important step uh, on this uh, path in the military life. Uh, it was, at the time, a way for me to pay for college. Uh, but it was very important at the time also uh, that it filled a need for me uh, that I felt uh, just to provide some kind of service uh, back to, to the community and to the nation at large. And so for that, it was an important step for me. Um, so four years later, I graduated. I was commissioned a second lieutenant in the United States Air Force, and I started off as, a, as an intelligence officer. And, um, you know, I, at that whole point of those, those four years, uh, <clears throat> And the four years following for me in that first assignment was really building a foundation of learning, uh, you know, what it was that was important to me, what was uh, uh, made me as a, a, an important individual and, uh, and a contributing member of the, the military. Um, and so as I go through this pathway, I hope that I can <clears throat> highlight a little bit for you uh, about uh, uh, what I think are some immutable truths uh, and things that uh, are going to be hopeful, hopefully helpful for you as you guys go forward uh, in, in your careers. Um, I started off with uh, uh, after, uh, after my intelligence officer uh, training and intelligence officer uh, uh, first assignment, uh, I transitioned to the space uh, career field. And I started off as a space operations officer in California, where I, I was uh, uh, a flight commander, a mission director, a launch officer. And I really got a chance to really learn the ropes of uh, what it really means to, to operate and, and work in the space environment. Uh, and for me, that was an important step and a cr crucial one in, in my, my development. Uh, you know, I, I attended the Naval Postgraduate School shortly thereafter uh, and get, got my uh, master's degree in electrical engineering. And uh, I, the only reason I put the, the uh, little graduation hats on there and, and a point that I'd like to emphasize is that, uh, you know, throughout your life, uh, no matter whether it's formal or informal education, uh, you're, you're constantly learning <clears throat> as you go through uh, uh, your careers. Um, and so uh, take that to heart. It's uh, something that uh, will, will never leave you as, as you go through this. Um, after graduation from the Naval Postgraduate School, I ended up doing uh, some uh, spacecraft program manager work for the National Reconnaissance Office, where we were developing some uh, very specialized uh, sensors for spacecraft. Uh, again, I, I ended up going back to school for this time for a military uh, degree in, in military operational art and science. Uh, and then I ended up going to the Pentagon, uh, which is, uh, you know, the five sided wind tunnel. Uh, which uh, it was a, a definitely a great learning experience. Uh, I learned how to handle money and how to handle uh, larger programs uh, while I was at the Pentagon. Um, and during that time, uh, I want to highlight something that I think that's important as you go through your careers is, is that it's really a, a career life balance. And so during that time frame, when I was kind of learning the craft of, of the space world, 
Uh, that's when I, I married my lovely wife, Francie, and uh, my, my daughter and my son were both born, and they're currently in high school right now. And so uh, I have a sense of, to some degree, I think, hopefully, what you guys are going through. Um, <clears throat> after, uh, in around 2007, I started my first command assignment as a squadron commander at a, uh, a command and control site uh, out in Colorado uh, for spacecrafts uh, systems, uh, ended up uh, finishing up that tour after two years, uh, went back to school again, um, it never ends. Uh, and shortly after that, I was a program director out at the Missile Defense Agency for uh, Command and Control Systems uh, for the Missile Defense Agency, if you're familiar with what they do. Uh, and then I ended my career uh, uh, as a, a commander for launch systems in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where we launched uh, a lot of different target systems and rockets and so forth. And, and it was very, uh, it was a great experience. Uh, and, and like I said, my career in the Air Force was almost strictly with the space community. And so uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, today, I'm a senior project manager out at uh, MIT Lincoln Laboratory. It's, uh, it's associated with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, where we do a lot of uh, systems analysis on future space architectures. And we do a lot of prototyping and development of, of advanced systems uh, for future uh, space architecture. And so we deal a lot with the Space Force here. And so hopefully I can shed a little bit of light on uh, what the Space Force is and why, uh, why I think it's critical to our, our nation's defense. Um, so the next uh, slide is, is just kind of a obvious question I think a lot of folks might ask is, you know, why a Space Force? We've, we really haven't had one uh, before. We've had uh, certainly space activities and space command and so forth. Um, but I think it's critical to understand uh, uh, how deeply entwined our daily lives are uh, with space. Uh, you know, when it talk, we talk about um, financial transactions, uh, weather forecasting, uh, navigation, power grids, uh, emergency responders, everything relies on space. And it, it's somewhat invisible to a lot of us um, in our daily lives. And it's critical to our, our national interest, but also our national defense. And you know, just as a history, space has traditionally been a sanctuary. While we were going through the, the Cold War, uh, we had strategic competition, you know, most notably with the USSR and, and Russia. Uh, but a lot of that changed in 2007 when China, China launched its first uh, anti-satellite uh, test uh, and destroyed one of their own satellites, uh, demonstrating that capability. The U.S. followed suit shortly after. And in the intervening 10 to 12 years or so, uh, there have been a, a number of notable space um, uh, warfare uh, overtures that are important uh, to, to how we run uh, our national defense uh, by North Korea, Russia, China, and others. And so the character of warfare in outer space is actually has changed dramatically. So hopefully that impresses upon you a little bit about how important I think it is today. And so briefly, a little bit about the United States Space Force. Uh, you know, I have the mission statement up at the top um, and the logo on the left. It's obviously our newest uh, uh, um, arm of the uh, Department of Defense. It's actually under the uh, US Air Force Secretary of the Air Force from a civilian controls perspective. Um, it's not even what, 15, 16 months old or so. It's relatively new. It's also the smallest of the services, around 16,000 people, all pretty much carved out of the Air Force. Uh, and it is a very selective and competitive uh, service right now. Um, they're, they've uh, uh, only recently started accepting folks from the US Air Force Academy into the Space Force, as well as some new enlisted uh, en enlistees and, and others uh, as well. So it's very much a selective force at this point. Uh, on the left, you, you can kind of see some of the capabilities of what uh, the U.S. Space Force uh, is intending to do. Um, and there's a lot of different career options within the Space Force, uh, from operations to development engineering, uh, intelligence specialists, uh, communications as well. Uh, so there's a lot of great uh, things about the U.S. Uh, uh, Space Force. And I have a little website down there below. You can always go and, and find out more. So. Uh, I'm excited to talk about it if uh, you guys have any questions later on. So, Julie, back to you. I think that's all I've got. Lieutenant Colonel Jacobs would like to, to begin. Julie, thanks for having me. Um, I graduated uh, with Julie back in 1994. It, it seems like a long time ago, but it really isn't. 
Uh, I had a great career in the military. I started off at uh, Carroll High School. I graduated there, like I said, in 1994. Um, I'll just throw a little piece of advice out there. Cast a wide net um, if you're interested in the military. Uh, I applied to several uh, scholarship opportunities um, and uh, the United States Air Force Academy. I ended up going to Georgia Tech on a uh, ROTC scholarship, uh, just like Urban did. And uh, I majored in electrical engineering. Um, I hated it. It was not fun, um, but I got it done. I swallowed the pill and I moved on. I commissioned and I fulfilled what I wanted to do uh, in my career, and that was to be a pilot in the Air Force. Um, I'll just keep this really brief. Uh, I mainly flew cargo. I flew C-17s. Uh, a lot of it was in the uh, midst of Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, I spent about 10 years flying um, in and out of theater, uh, combat missions. Uh, spent a lot of time in the desert, uh, a lot of time away from family. So it was a sacrifice, but uh, I enjoyed serving my country doing that. Uh, I ended up actually my uh, second to last assignment working a joint assignment at U uh, United States Central Command. It's like when the military thinks that they're doing you a favor by trying to enhance your career, but you don't wanna do it. Um, but I got sent there for about three years and uh, Thoroughly enjoyed it because I got to see what the other forces had to offer. So the United States Marine Corps, I have a huge respect for them. Army, not so much, no offense. Um, Navy, not so bad, but all kidding aside, it was a great assignment. That joint opportunity really opened my eyes to what um, the United States Air Force brings to the joint fight, um, but also what everybody else brings as well. End of my career, uh, flying for a small uh, uh, select unit, uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. at Andrews Air Force Base, where I flew the presidential family, the first, uh, the first lady, uh, the vice president uh, for about five years. And then I retired from the military. And now I'm, I love flying cargo so much. I'm a, I'm a cargo pilot at FedEx uh, here in Memphis. Um, I've got uh, four children, uh, my wife. Uh, my youngest, youngest sister is an air officer commanding at the Air Force Academy. Um, so if, uh, if anybody has any questions on that, I'll be happy to answer um, later. But um, I will say, just if I don't get to answer any questions later, um, Sarah, Josh, John, and Coleman, uh, like I said, exciting times for you, cast a wide net. And I, I would say that um, the, the military is, is very good with camaraderie, but uh, there's gonna be some times where you're gonna be alone and uh, it's gonna be kind of isolating and uh, people are going to tell you no. Even in high school, people might tell you, hey, you can't do this, you can't do that when you're in college, when you get into your career. Um, but I would say if you have a dream, if you have a goal, uh, follow it. Uh, don't let anybody tell you no. And uh, really fight through the negativity um, and be your, be your own biggest advocate uh, for your life and your career. And I think that makes a big difference from where you want to go. And so with that, Julie, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Vince. Um, so next we have Major Amanda Taylor Nurk uh, from the class of 2005, and she also represents the U.S. Air Force. Hello, um, are you guys able to hear me well? I was having issues. Okay, sweet. Um, so yeah, so uh, Amanda Nurk, I am. I will be in the Air Force for almost 11 years now. Um, it will be 11 years come May. It's been extremely exciting. Um, so yeah, I graduated from Carroll in 2005 and went to uh, Michigan Tech University, which is, uh, so this is Michigan, this is the Upper Peninsula, it's like way up here. Um, my goal was to get as far away from my parents as possible after I graduated from high school. Um, so they let me go about 14 hours north. Um, so started out as a environmental engineer and failed miserably for the first two years of college. Um, and that's when I decided to switch my career field to business administration. Um, so I was able to get a bachelor's in um, with, or business degree and I uh, commissioned into the Air Force uh, in the contracting field. So um, contracting, it's a uh, very acquisitions based. So basically anything that we can't do in house, we contract out. So construction services, um, base custodial, 
uh, ground maintenance, supplies and commodities. And then also uh, right now what I'm working on are big weapon systems um, such as our aircraft. So I've been doing that my entire career. I've had some really amazing opportunities being able to deploy overseas. I actually just came back from a deployment um, a couple weeks ago. So I apologize for kind of being very <laughs> um, casual. I'm currently on my R&R &R, um, at home. So I've uh, been very exciting. Uh, been able to go to uh, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, uh, spent some time in Spain, um, and then right now just came back from Saudi Arabia. Um, but I want to echo what the first two said. Um, Carol really did kind of set that um, set that bar for or that foundation for success. Um, a lot of a lot of things um, from Carol kind of helped me through um, all of the, the challenges that I went through in college and then um, also prepared me to be even more successful uh, in the Air Force. Um, it's a very big leap going from high school um, to college. Um, so just having that, um, that foundation of, um, I will say the, the, the faith. Um, so Carol was, I, I really appreciated everything that, uh, that Carol did as far as um, building uh, my faith in God and um, kind of helping me through that path because had had I not had that college and uh, all of the experiences uh, through the Air Force had been would have been a little bit more challenging. Um, so uh, very thankful for that. Um, as you progress um, in your life and then also in your career, uh, one of the biggest takeaways that I've, I've had is building those relationships and networking. Um, I have made some absolutely fantastic friends, great mentors um, all throughout these past, uh, goodness, almost 16 years after I've graduated from Carroll. So um, just keep, a, keep an open mind um, and yeah, uh, don't have much else to <laughs> contribute right now, but definitely willing to, to answer any questions. Thank you, Amanda. We're gonna go next to Lieutenant Commander Nicholas Memoring, class of 2005, representing the Navy. Hello everyone, how are you all doing this morning? Um, like I said, I was class of 2005. I've known John there almost my whole life, so it's good to see him again. I'm currently stationed in San Diego. It's nice and sunny out here, uh, a little bit, Older, about 60 degrees, but uh, I think I'll be able to survive. I know. Um, I've had a great career in the Navy. I'm a Navy helicopter pilot. Um, been able to fly for about 12 years now. So I'm pretty happy with that. Very lucky to be able to do what I've been able to do. Um, so I left Carroll uh, Class 05, went to Purdue Industrial Technology, uh, graduated in 09, went to Pensacola, Florida for flight training. Spent about two years down there. Uh, flew the T-34 and the TH-57 uh, for helicopters, and then from there went to Norfolk, Virginia for my first tour, uh, uh, flying the MH-60 Sierra, which is basically the Navy version of a Black Hawk. Um, did two deployments there, uh, one on the USS Kearsarge. Uh, with that one, I got to see some pretty cool places. Uh, did the Straits uh, Transit um, through the Suez when it wasn't blocked, and then uh, Hit Spain, which was beautiful. I highly recommend if you ever get a chance. I got to go back with my second time because I first went to Spain as part of the Carroll trip. Uh, so I actually went back to some of the places I had visited from the Carroll trip when I was in Spain again. It was awesome. Uh, Jerusalem, Israel, uh, Djibouti, Egypt, all around the Suez. It was great. Um, came back and then I did another deployment to Italy for six months, which was uh, an awesome tour. Really that I was just, I went all around Europe, saw Sweden, Germany, Belgium, France, uh, Latvia, great places. Uh, the Navy's, uh, I've gotten to see a lot of great places and fill up my passport book with some of the places I've been able to go. Um, after that, I went back to Pensacola to be an instructor. Probably one of the most rewarding careers or things I've been able to do is go back and kind of understand what it's like to teach and some of the frustrations and patience that's required in order to teach someone to fly a helicopter. Um, but I did that for three years and then I came to San Diego uh, where I'm again, also an instructor again, but I also do um, kind of a unique 
mission out here right now. It's a range. I work on the range here for some of our underwater uh, and above water uh, training that we do. So I, I put targets in the water and pull them back out basically. But on the side, uh, I do aerial firefighting. And then that's kind of something that's different. You don't see too much in Ohio, but we got a lot of fires out here in San Diego. So last year we had five fires, including the Valley Fire. Um, so I was participant in that. And then also sadly the Bonhomme Richard, I was the first one on the scene for that. Um, some of the most intense flying I've probably ever done involved uh, that ship fire. So that was sad, but um, able to get that done. Um, I have enjoyed every bit of what I've done in the Navy. I'm very glad and very um, honored that I'm able to do what I do. Next, I'm going to the Navy War College in June. So I'll be going all the way across to Rhode Island uh, so I can get my master's. Um, Carol, I, I would say really set me up with how to study and how to prepare. I think that's one of the biggest things I learned at Carol was how to, how to, how to be a good student, which has helped me through flight school and some of the other things, that, other challenges I've had. Um, can't say enough good things about that and then where I went to school and, and all the people I've met. Um, I will say this, funny enough, I've met two Carroll alum, uh, Tony Chitwood, who's actually in John's class 06, uh, is also a Navy helicopter pilot and I've crisscrossed paths with him. He was in San Diego when I was in Norfolk and then when I moved to San Diego, he moved to Norfolk. So we've crisscrossed paths a few times, including flight school. And then secondly, uh, I was just the other day in the back of the helicopter doing a, I was watching an instructor mission and the student up front was sitting there and we were talking uh, and he's gotta be about six years behind me, eight years behind me, he's a JG. And he has, oh, where are you from? I said, Ohio, he's like, I'm from Beaver Creek. And we find out he went to Carroll and he graduated in 2012. So you never know when you're gonna meet some of those, those Carroll alum. Um, and we got to talk about that. And I actually did get to go do a flight with him, which was pretty cool. So uh, you never know who you're gonna meet. And I'll be happy to answer any questions we got about the Navy or, or flight school. And, the biggest thing with the Navy that's just a little bit different is that we go out on big gray ships for six or seven months at a time. And that's probably one of the toughest things. But outside of COVID, you do get to pull in some pretty cool ports. So, and you get to travel with the Marines every now and then. And we go back and forth on that, but it's all good. I have some really good friends who are Marines. That's awesome. Uh, Carol's one big family. <laughs> um, okay, next, uh, Captain Jonathan Lauren. Uh, class of 2006, representing the Marines. Hi, gang. Uh, John Lauren here. I do know Nick, and actually the Bonhomme Richard is the one of the ships that I deployed on. So uh, I was watching that uh, that ship fire. Uh, did not realize that Nick was one of the first responders. So thank you, Nick. Um, my path was a little bit different. Um, graduating from Ohio, uh, correction, from Carroll High School, and then moving uh, actually to the enlisted side. Um, I did, I like several of my brothers, my dad, I enlisted first, uh, straight out of Carroll, and then went to college on the military's dime. Uh, so I, I transferred to Carroll, had multiple siblings already graduate from Carroll, um, and uh, just through family financials, had to, I had to trade in. Um, came in on the soccer and track team, which I think built up a lot of the uh, characteristics that you're going to see flourish throughout the rest of the military career. Um, and I enlisted and immediately went to Okinawa, Japan, um, where I was stationed for about a year and a half, and then, uh, and then went to the Naval Academy for college. Um, so I was able to leverage, you know, one of the military assets to help myself um, get better. And knowing that I wanted to return to the Marine Corps as an officer, uh, I Majored in physics is something I was interested in. I minored in Arabic. They don't really go together. Uh, that was not a great course load. Um, and uh, went to become an active duty officer. And I only deployed to Southeast Asia. Um, in the Marines, physics doesn't help much. And in the Marines, uh, if you're deploying to Southeast Asia, Arabic doesn't help as much. So um, you'll see also, I like to learn a lot about a little. Uh, or correction, a, a little about a lot. Uh, so that way I can talk to everybody. Um, and that kind of uh, manifested itself in my officer career as well. I, I became an intelligence officer, left the radio field behind. Um, I was an intelligence officer for about 1,200 Marines uh, and some Navy uh, for a, a deployment where we were on the Bonhomme Richard. Uh, and then I got back and became the scout sniper platoon commander um, where 
as like a, an organic reconnaissance asset for a battalion. Uh, we talked more about that. It was a, both a challenging and rewarding experience. Um, and then I went over to where we make Marines, um, not OCS, Officer Candidate School, but the next school, the basic school where you learn all of the characteristics of uh, Marine officership. Um, it's a six month school for students straight out of college. I, I taught there and over several years, uh, taught about 5,000 students, became a master instructor. And on the side, uh, started a business with my wife. Um, so. Uh, that was a challenging experience. We're still working on it right now. Um, and it's something that uh, as our family grew, I wanted to provide more time back to my family. You can see we have three kids at this point. Um, and that's why I made the decision to leave the active duty military. Uh, I, again, a different perspective than everybody else. I, I'd been in for about 13 years at this point. Um, and I decided to leave without hitting the, you know, the, the 20 year pension. Um, I left so that way I could learn more about the business side, spend more time as a, as a father and husband, um, and move back to Ohio where, uh, where we really wanted to be. So I'm, I'm actually in Columbus. I am three finals away from my uh, MBA. They are two tomorrow and one the next day. So make sure you study because I'm sure yours are coming up as well. Um, and I'll be going to uh, JP Morgan Chase actually this summer um in mid-july i'm still in the marine corps reserves i am a captain uh i went from enlisted to officer uh i'm i still have that reserve commission and i still periodically teach at the basic school when i get some time off from uh being a student at ohio state um i would also echo some of the sentiments uh from from vince from nick the marines are the best that's why i wanted to join them um and uh, I 100% concur that the Army, eh. um, but uh, I will be glad to answer any questions. Um, both my brothers, two of my brothers rather, are Marines as well. Uh, it runs in the family and it's something that uh, we always try to break out of each other's shadow. So uh, glad to be here, glad to give something back to the community because this was something that uh, I think if you learn how to leverage all the different opportunities in front of you, then um, by understanding the system, then you can help yourself and help a lot more than just yourself. So while, while you were talking about the Army, um, uh, Major James Borchers from the Army joined us. So I'm sure that, <laughs> I'm sure that he, uh, uh, not sure how to respond to those Army comments right now. No, no, no. Uh, uh, John, great words. Uh, I don't know. So this is 21 years and it doesn't matter. It's all the, once you've been in long enough, it's like, you know, Navy Marines there. It doesn't matter. And we're all in it together. Next, we'll go with uh, Lieutenant Junior Grades, Adam Wilhelm, class of 2015. Uh, like Ms. White said, I was a 2015 grad of Carroll. Um, so not, not all that long ago. Uh, I played soccer and I wrestled um, at Carroll. And after I graduated from Carroll, I went to the U.S. Coast Guard Academy, which is in New London, Connecticut. Um, I was a government major there, and I had a concentration in politics, policy, and law. Um, Coast Guard's kind of the uh, kind of the, the baby brother of the services, I would say. Um, after the Space Force, now we're the second smallest, um, a little bit smaller than the New York Police Department. So it's kind of, there's not a lot of talk about the Coast Guard Academy. Um, I didn't really hear about it until I was probably a, a junior. I was looking at the other academies. I had a cousin who was in the Coast Guard and he recommended that I look at the, the Coast Guard Academy. So I started looking into that a little bit more and I really got a, uh, a drive to join the Coast Guard just based on the mission set, we do um, a lot of really diverse and very cool missions. Uh, we do uh, law enforcement, a lot of law enforcement, um, drug and migrant interdiction, mostly down south, both in the Atlantic and Pacific. Um, we do AIDS navigation maintenance. So we maintain the entire system of buoys across the entire country that all of the shipping 
that comes in by sea, which is a very large portion um, coming in on cargo ships into major ports. We maintain all of that buoyage so that they don't run aground like you saw in uh, the Suez Canal. We really don't want that to happen here. Um, as we have the Chesapeake Bay that we maintain, which is one of the largest and highly most highly transited passages in the world. Um, and we also do a lot of search and rescue. So we have a lot of air assets. Um, the, uh, the helicopter that he was talking about earlier, the 60, we also have a version of that that we use for search and rescue. Um, and so we have a very, we do, we do a lot of environmental protection as well. Um, that's actually going to be my job. I'm stationed currently up in Alaska. Um, I'm just about to transfer to the Coast Guard Cutter Anna Kappa to be the executive officer, which is the second in command. And we do a lot of fisheries enforcement. So that is dealing with all of the fishermen, making sure that they're following all the regulations, making sure they're not overfishing, um, doing all kinds of environmental protection, make sure everybody's following the laws they need to in order to maintain the fish for years to come. Um, I'm just coming from right out of the academy where I graduated in 2019. I went to the Coast Guard Cutter Spar in Kodiak, Alaska, um, which is an island off the, the southern coast. And there I was on a 225 foot buoy tender as a deck watch officer. So it was my job to drive the ship. We uh, would drive up on buoys, pull them out of the water, clean them, inspect them, make sure they're all good to go, make sure they're in the right spot and uh, put them back in the water. So I did that for two years. Um, that was very exciting, very rewarding tour. You see a lot of incredibly cool places. Um, particularly up in Alaska, which is gorgeous. I highly recommend if anybody hasn't been. Um, and then now I'm moving to Petersburg, Alaska, which is in Southeast. Um, so it's a little bit more protected. I'm in the inside passage, which goes from Alaska down into Canada and all the way down to uh, the Pacific Northwest. Um, the Coast Guard's given me a ton of opportunities to go to uh, a lot of really cool places. I've gotten to go to London, uh, Dublin, um, Dominican Republic, Honduras, Colombia, um, Curacao, just St. Thomas, a lot of really, really cool places around. You get a good chance to travel. Um, we've got uh, Coast Guards been posted all over the world um, from Asia, Latin Europe. We help out a lot in Africa. Um, there's a big there's a lot of opportunities in the Coast Guard that are kind of um, underrepresented. You don't hear a lot about them, but it's a great chance to do a mission every day. Um, a lot of the other services, they do a lot of training and they do a lot of missions too, but um, the Coast Guard, you have a job that you're doing every single day, um, which is very, very cool to me. Um, but yeah, it's, a great service. I'm, I originally wanted to go to the Naval Academy and I'm pretty glad that I got into the Coast Guard Academy. It's probably the best thing that ever happened to me. I love the Coast Guard and I would definitely recommend it to anybody. But uh, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Thank you. Oh, um, thank you for your time today, number one. But I just kind of was going to ask, I noticed you all kind of took different paths and not many were to the actual, you know, Air Force Academy or Naval Academy, it was more of the ROTC scholarship. So if you could just go into maybe a little bit of detail on what that was and what you looked into versus going to an academy or a different school on that scholarship. Yeah, I, I received an appointment to the Air Force Academy um, uh, along with uh, Mike Zagoda, Julie remembers him from our, from our class. And uh, although it was extremely competitive, I did have a chance to go to a summer seminar uh, opportunity after my sophomore year in high school where uh, they select about 500 students across the country, and you're able to go uh, immerse yourself into Colorado Springs and everything that the Air Force Academy uh, has to offer. Um, after looking at that, and then um, as all y'all are going to soon see, or if you haven't seen on your on your college visits, you're going to be able to compare and contrast uh, an academy experience with potentially what it's going to be like as a uh, in a civilian <clears throat> institution. Uh, so once I, I put apples to oranges, I, I felt it, it better fit my personality 
uh, to go to Georgia Tech instead of the Air Force Academy. Um, however, I mean, I think it was um, it was either John or, or Nicholas that was saying, uh, or even James, we're all one big happy family once you're in it long enough. Um, and so the, the stovepipe uh, military services all kind of converge into a joint uh, uh, venture uh, after a while. So to answer your question, Sarah, uh, my decision was made uh, more personality based, um, but there's also other factors involved too, as far as location. Um, also, uh, what kind, what's your finances like? Sometimes it's better to go because it's, um, it's paid for, uh, quite frankly. So yeah, you can still serve your country and go to college for free. Uh, if you don't get a, a full ride ROTC scholarship. So that's definitely a variable in the equation that you have to consider. And I'll, I'll give it over to James. Yeah, well said Vince. Um, this is still the fact. And we, after World War II, our political leaders then developed the Montgomery GI Bill, fastest way out of poverty, factual, fastest way out of poverty, Montgomery GI Bill service to your country. It's either GI Bill or you buy a home. But in our case, so my background, I joined at the start of my junior year of 2000, pre 9-11. And uh, I came from nothing. Actually, my senior year of tuition, I paid for myself because I worked at Dayton Dragons when they opened. Bought my Chrysler LeBaron and uh, paid my way. So what I'll say to the group is this. Do you have a chance to go to the service academy? Do it. It is fantastic. It will grow you up quick and it will prepare you for a global climate that's out there. I wouldn't say, you know, we have our country, but there's a lot, lot of things going on, a lot of competition out there. And there's no, when, a, when you go and you do your service time and you earn it, and you get it back because the government will get it back from you. Trust me, one way or another. Everybody sitting here will agree with that. I will tell you this much. You get a chance to go to the service academy, it'll change your life. It'll catapult you into an area where you, you have a lot of options. But then again, what Vince said, everybody's different. I, I was an ROTC. I did my final junior and senior year through ROTC at Wright State. Loved every bit of it. I wasn't the type that's cut out to be in the service academy. I was enlisted for seven years for a reason. You know what I mean? So everybody's going to figure that out. But on the issue of the GI Bill and what you have to do, everybody has their own path to figure out. Being a graduate of Carroll High School sets you apart because the discipline and the mentality, what it takes once you're out on your own and the military if you do it right, we'll give you the keys and the tools to help you on your path. And I was also going to add one last thing. Hey, I, I thought Congressman Steve Ostra, he's still out there. He's a Carroll grad. There's some great resources out there. Some great people can get behind you and support you, but you got to do the work. And, you know, whatever path you choose to go with, Julie knows my contact info. You guys can reach me or send me an email anytime. I've worked with Carroll graduates in the past. I think I started maybe in 2013 or 14, something like that with this program, but tons of resources. There's so much info that we can't give you in an hour, but just take your time, figure it out. And that's, that's what you're supposed to be doing now. So that's, that's my two cents on it. I'll add one more thing real quick so we can get to the next question as well. Um, coming from a service academy, one thing you can't forget is like the reason that you are there. Being from a service academy is great. Being at a service academy sometimes is not fun at all. Um, so you have to keep the light at the end of the tunnel like clearly illuminated so that way you don't lose track of uh, you know the, the small distractions on the side because um, it is it is free. I had to my, my parents were going to make me pay for college so I looked for free options or, or scholarships, grants, things like that. Naval Academy was free. I didn't get in the first time. That's why I enlisted. Uh, and I spent two years enlisted and then reapplied. They love reappliers. They love older because you're more mature and they love military backgrounds. It's a less competitive pool to come from the military to an academy. So if you enlist first, you get access to the GI Bill. You can start taking college classes while you're enlisted. And then you can go to a full-time school, get some credit hour transfers, start off ahead of your peers. And as a more mature individual, 
um, understanding a little bit more of you know the world uh, and those that you are soon to be leading because the expectation of a, of a graduate from ROTC or an academy as an officer is you are a leader right from the get-go. Um, so you, you can get that experience of what the followers need from their eyes and, and truly feel it before you make that transition. Um, so just a perspective is like, I, I watched Marines drop out of the Naval Academy because they lost sight of what that end goal was. So don't forget that. It's not easy, but it is great. Even through ROTC, you get sidetracked. There's all kinds of noise, all kinds of distractions. But if you keep the goal, get that goal bar, get the commission, keep that in mind. John nailed it. That was great. James, did you cover everything you wanted to cover? I, I kind of skipped over you for your background. Are you, are you good with everything you said or did you want to add anything else? Hey, I was just going to say, in closing, keep this in mind, everybody, one team, one fight. It's fun to have the armed forces competition. It's super fun. It's great. But at the end of the day, one team, one fight. Every branch is specifically designed to fight in a certain way. I'll tell you from the experience of the Army, after the Marines come in, after the Navy and Air all do their part, the Army, we got to pay, you know, we're the mayors. We're the ones that's got to clean it all up and try to organize it. So every branch is so particular, like to the Coast Guard with Lieutenant Wilhelm. Hey, I've worked, I mean, a lot of the Coast Guard, they, because the Navy's just stretched thin, you know, they don't have the patrol boats, they don't have the... So I've worked with a lot of Coast Guard in Egypt, Israel, uh, Kuwait, ports of Kuwait. It, so it's, it, it all depends. And then what even complicates it more is, hey, this is the longest war we've ever been in as a nation. It's still not in. It's the war on terror. It started in 9-11. I was in Mr. Lakin's wood shop, junior year, September 11, 2001, listening to the radio. We were in disbelief. So things happen quick. Best thing you can do is have a faith in God and being a Catholic and faith in God is all I can tell you is what got me through a lot. And I'll, I'll close with this. If there was one thing I learned out of all of this, there ain't no atheist in foxhole. What gets you through the hardest times and the challenges is you've got to have the faith. And this is what Carol does. It gives you that faith. It'll give you, as long as you have that Holy Spirit with you, it will be your guide. And it'll always be, you know, God's always there. So that's, don't ever forget, that's what makes us unique. You know, that we are Catholic and that you have this opportunity not a lot of people get just to go to Carol. You know, so just keep that in mind. Everybody sacrifices, especially now. Just remember, hey, the world is what you make it. Keep the passion, but just remember, keep the faith. God bless. It's It's been, you know, it's great to be a part of this. I have a question. Was there anything, anything you especially missed about civilian life when you served? So just coming back from the, the recent deployment, just like just having a little bit more freedoms, like being able to make my own food and like decide what I want to eat rather than being given that. Um, but other civilian things, um, I don't know. I I personally really enjoy uh, the the military life. Um, I think that there's a lot of uh, discipline. There's a I someone mentioned the camaraderie um, early on, um, and I know probably in about nine years when I'm eligible to retire, I'll probably not want to <laughs> just because um, military life, it, uh, it is like a second family. Um, so just having, having those amazing opportunities to, to build the, those friendships. Um, but yeah, probably just the food, just being able to like <laughs> have good food um, and be able to choose what kind of food I want is what I miss <laughs> about um, the civilian life. How did you tell your family and friends that you were joining the military? Anyone want to answer that one? It, 
for it wasn't a major uh, uh, announcement or anything like that. I mean, I was applying. My my father was in the military, uh, so it wasn't uh, you know, and it was in the mid '80s, so you know, it was uh, the Reagan buildup, and and uh, I don't think there was uh, any major shock there. But uh, you know, today that can be because you know when you tell your family that you're committing to this, uh, you know, whether it be two years, four years, or twenty or beyond. Uh, you know, that does mean that uh, you're going to be moving and you're going to be going away. That's kind of what uh, I think Amanda's talking about is there's a, a lack of, I don't want to call it stability, but, you know, you're constantly transitioning, you're transitioning jobs, you're, but it expands you as a person um, and it takes you a lot of different places and it exposes you to a community that uh, you may not otherwise uh, interact with if you don't uh, make those transitions. So uh, the announcement itself wasn't a big deal. I think the 20 years, 25 years of uh, moving around uh, and, uh, and forming friendships. I mean, I have friends now throughout the country and overseas and, uh, and, and those are important uh, uh, bonds that uh, will never be broken. So that's my two cents. Uh, what was basic training like? Anyone want to answer that? I thought uh, basic training was extremely easy because I think some of you guys have attested to you played soccer and those two days with Coach Molfenter were some of the hardest things I've ever done. So Molfenter, if you've been exposed to, to what he offers, those two days were absolutely brutal so for me i didn't think it was that bad having seen both the enlisted and the officer side i would say the enlisted side was harder uh physically the officer side was harder mentally um so uh understand that everything's going to be physically challenging um and they're you know you go with the expectation that you're going to be deprived of sleep deprived of food you're going to be making decisions when things are really difficult and when those times show up and it's not fun that's exactly why you're there uh, is to kind of build your low, your highest level of training. So that way, when you're tired, that's what you'll fall back on is exactly what you've trained for. Do you have any advice uh, to give a student trying to get in the military? Anything that you haven't already mentioned? I'll talk from, ahead, uh, from my perspective about getting into the Coast Guard Academy. Um, I mean, they love well-rounded people. I mean, if you just do like one or two, like just one thing, like that's your thing. It's going to be a little difficult. They want, they, they like sports. They, um, they like extracurricular activities. They like community service. Um, anything you do that shows that you're kind of above and beyond um, the other candidates. I mean, so the more you can do, the better. I mean, it's just anything that you can add that makes you look better to them. I mean, community service. I mean, they love it. Leadership positions in those organizations that you're in. Um, like I was captain of the wrestling team and head of the youth and government um, club. So like those types of leadership positions, they love leadership. I mean, that's what you're going there to do. That's what you, that's the biggest thing that they're trying to teach you there. So if you have leadership experience, um, they love that. I'll quickly just add, don't close doors before you have to. Um, Carol opens up a lot of doors for you. Uh, and you should focus your efforts on the, the few that you want, but that doesn't mean you need to close the doors on other options because uh, as life changes in a year or two, that might become your most viable option or your most desired option um, that you previously thought was something you didn't want to pursue. Um, so keep those doors open, even if uh, it feels like you're dragging them along a little bit. Like most people give you the benefit of the doubt if you're coming from a military background they know life is hectic they know you have a lot of decisions to make and you have a lot a lot to weigh to make those decisions so keep keep those doors open as long as you want um while while directing your focus on whatever you are prioritizing at that moment i was just going to uh <clears throat> i was going to close just there's really nothing that y'all should be fearful of nothing you can't overcome. The one thing, um, geez, I've been kind of like all around the world. I, you know, I've deployed a lot, seen, seen a lot of combat and stuff. And I'll tell you this much, where we come from, from Dayton, Ohio, this place that we're at and being all around the country, they don't make them like we, like who you are. Being from Ohio is tough. Being from Ohio, 
and especially Catholic and people of faith, you're already above. And we, and you can see it just in our politics, how it's changing. We're not Californians, we're, New York, we're not New Yorkers, we're all one. It's one team, one fight. And what Ohio and what each and every one of you gets to bring to the table is something very special. And what separates us, in my opinion, is this, our work ethic. We work very hard. We have values that you can't get in a lot of places in this country. We place our family first. We place God first. And we place a lot of other things that's called selfless service. That's why you're training right now and you don't even know it. And when you get out there and if you choose to, to raise that right hand, and swear an oath to protect this constitution, the country. Just remember though, where you came from, Dayton, Ohio. And it's, be very proud of that, no matter what happens, because we're just as strong as everybody else out there. And when you get tested, it's awesome. It's awesome to see it works in your background, everything your parents sacrifice for you, everything. You go and you earn it, and then you pay it forward too. And there's no greater way to pay it forward to living in this great nation than serving. That's the best, that's the ultimate sacrifice and especially this day is late, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, it's less than 1%, less than 1%. So the new census had us at 331 million. It's the slowest growth we've ever had. And then what they did was they did the financials and they turned this into a giant math equation, black belt, green belt. It doesn't matter anyways. They trimmed us down to a very lean, mean machine and how we operate. So just remember that it's, it's, it's what you make of it, but don't be afraid of nothing because of the background and where you're coming from. You can compete and oh, when you do and you're on top, it's amazing. So that's my advice. Don't ever lose the faith. One team, one fight. Go for it. Are there any final comments that any of you would like to share with the students? Good luck. And if you want to reach out to any of us, Julie has her contact info. Thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time to, to join us and try to help a little bit. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for your service. Hey, Julie, you're fantastic. You are, you are pulling Carol together. We never had this. Thank you. Principal Sobleski is my coach. Good, great leadership. You guys are doing what we need to do to keep, keep the, keep this going, grabbing the torch. So it's great to see anything you need, Julie, reach out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Have a great day.